What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Have you ever gazed in wonder at the Great Pyramid? Have you marveled at the golden face of Tutankhamun? Or admired the delicate features of Queen Nefertiti? If you have, you'll probably like the History of Egypt podcast. Every week, we explore tales of this ancient culture. The History of Egypt is available wherever you get your podcasting fix. Come, let me introduce you to the world of ancient Egypt. Hi everyone, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please support the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the ancient world. Thanks again for listening. In the late 10th century BC, any hopes or plans for a reunified Israel met their end on the battlefield. At the Battle of Mount Zemaraim, King Jeroboam of Israel squared off against Rehoboam's son, King Abijah of Judah. Abijah dealt Jeroboam a staggering defeat, and could have proceeded to march up north and claim all of Israelite territory. Instead, the victorious Judean king only annexed a few border cities. Whatever fault lines had formed between the two kingdoms, religious, political, tribal, or otherwise, had already grown into chasms. Around 900 BC, an Israelite general named Basha usurped the throne by assassinating Jeroboam's son, King Nadab, then slaughtering all of his lines. Conflict soon flared up between Basha and the latest Judean king, Asa, the son of Abijah. If you look at the hypothetical frontiers of early 9th century Israel and Judah, and again, I'll point you to the maps I've posted, a few things are quickly apparent. While Israel had access to the Mediterranean and close relations, materially and culturally, with the Canaanite cities of Phoenicia, Judah was significantly more isolated, surrounded by Philistines, Moabites, Edomites, and Israel itself. A need to generate wealth through trade made Judah vulnerable to blockades. Consequently, Basha reinforced key sites in southern Israel and built a new fort at Ramah, a few miles north of Jerusalem, for that very purpose. He also enlisted the support of a neighbor, King Bar-Hadad of Aram Damascus. By the early 9th century BC, Aram Damascus had stepped from the shadow of Soba to become the premier Aramean state of southern Syria. As I mentioned back in episode C-12, Bar-Hadad was likely responsible for the city's massive temple to the storm god Hadad Ramon. A separate monument, recovered near Aleppo, records the king's genealogy, stating, This stele was set up by Bar-Hadad, the son of Tab-Rimon, the son of Hezion, king of Aram, for his lord Melkart. It's tempting to associate Hezion with Rezon, the Sobin warrior who'd supposedly founded the kingdom. Looking at the map, it's not really clear why Damascene help was needed. My guess is that Judah had access to trade routes east across the Jordan, possibly through northern Ammonite territory, and Basha wanted to plug that potential hole. Bribes were apparently the name of the game. And after King Basha bribed Bar-Hadad to gain his support, King Asa of Judah sent his own bribe for Bar-Hadad to break the agreement. 
which Barhadad did. The Aramean king then attacked and captured several northern Israelite towns, forcing Basha to withdraw from his new southern outposts and march his army up north. The scenario apparently ended in a stalemate. And for those keeping score, that's a transfer of gold from Asa and Basha right into the pockets of Bar Hadad, who also gained more territory. You guys know how much I love Buzzkill Prophets, and I've got a few new entries for the Hall of Fame. After Asa's bribe had ended the threat, a local prophet named Hanani the seer ripped into the king for relying on help from Bar Hadad instead of relying on Yahweh. And since he was a seer, I assume he foresaw being thrown into jail for the remainder of Asa's reign. Sometime later, Hanani's son, Jehu, ripped into King Basha of Israel for practicing idolatry and foretold the end of his line, which came to pass when Basha's son, Elob, who'd succeeded him, was assassinated by a military commander named Zimri, who then, you guessed it, slaughtered all of King Basha's line. So, by 884 BC, Israel was on its second clean slate dynastic reset, while Judah kept right on chugging along with the unbroken line of King David, at least according to the Bible. There's a lot of scholarly kerfluffle about which Israelite tribe Zimri and his successors Tibni and Omri may have hailed from. Since both Zimri and Omri are old Amorite names, it still seems a very open question. Regardless, after Zimri's death, civil war raged for four long years between the military commanders Tibni and Omri, a conflict eventually won by the latter. Which is how the Israelites got their very first king mentioned in extra-biblical sources. So, let's take a few minutes to learn about King Omri. In the Bible, Omri barely merits a few passages. He supposedly reigned for six years in Tirzah, where Basha had moved the Israelite capital from Shechem, then six more years in the new capital of Samaria. Oh, and apparently, Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did worse than all that were before him. Which, even if they're just talking about the past few kings, that's a pretty incredible claim. Luckily, for the very first time, we have complementary sources, the most important of which is a famous stele erected by King Mesha of Moab. The Mesha stele, or Moabite stele, is incredibly significant for many, many reasons. To rattle off a short list... It's the longest Iron Age inscription ever found in the region. It provides a unique record of military campaigns that are otherwise unattested. The script it's written in, Moabite, has been determined to be a variant of the Phoenician alphabet and is also closely related to the Paleo-Hebrew script. It relates a story that parallels, with some differences, an episode in the biblical Book of Kings— It refers to the kingdom of Israel as Bit Omri, or the house of Omri. It may, double underline, refer to the kingdom of Judah as Bit David, or the house of David. And, last but not least, it bears the earliest confirmed extra-biblical reference to the Israelite god, Yahweh. While you guys are marinating in all that, I'll read a few lines from the Meshistele that are relevant to our story. It begins, I am Mesha, the son of Kamosh Yati, the king of Moab from Debon. My father was king over Moab for thirty years, and I was king after my father. And in Karcha, I made this high place for Kemosh because he has delivered me from all kings, and because he has made me look down on all my enemies. Omri was the king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab for many days, for Chemosh was angry with his land. 
Chemosh, as you may have guessed, was the patron deity of the Moabites, and may be depicted on the Late Bronze Age Al-Balu stele. The general takeaway is that during his reign, King Omri of Israel expanded his holdings to include northern Moabite territories east of the Jordan River. I also mentioned that it was Omri who moved the Israelite capital from Tirzah to Samaria, which, I should note, is only 30 miles from Tel Rahav. You guys all remember Tel Rahav, right? The fun little town with a million bees swarming around a massive apiary in the city center, generating a small fortune in wax and honey? I mean, how could you forget? So, it's time to bring these two stories together. As you may recall, archaeologist and historian Amihai Mazar suggested that it must have taken a strong authority, either royal, municipal, or a powerful local family, to compel the intrusive beehive insertion. And somewhat surprisingly, we actually have a hint of who it may have been. A jar recovered from inside the apiary was inscribed with the text belonging to Nimshi. The name Nimshi was also inscribed elsewhere in the city, as well as at another site six kilometers northwest, which suggests that a figure, family, or clan named Nimshi may have been the builder, owner, and or operator of the massive Tel Rahav apiary. This would have made them one of the main elite families at Tel Rahav, one figuratively dripping with bee money. As we also discussed, the apiary was destroyed in the early 9th century BC, celebrated for decades afterward as the day the buzzing stopped. I'm just joking. Probably. From what we can tell, the loss didn't have a major effect on Tel Rahav's general prosperity and the city retained strong trade relations with the Phoenician coast and, indirectly, with Egypt, Cyprus, and Greece. In fact, at the time, Tel Rahav was one of the largest cities in the southern Levant, despite the fact that it's rarely mentioned in contemporary texts. According to Mazar, during the early 9th century BC, the local Canaanite population of Tel Rahav integrated into and adapted to the political, religious, cultural Israelite entity, possibly even integrating an actual Israelite population into their community. Which, again, makes sense, since the new Israelite capital of Samaria was only 30 miles away. And, interestingly, there may be a close connection between King Omri of Israel and the Nimshi clan of Tel Rahav. Those familiar with the Bible may know that the future Israelite King Jehu supposedly came from the house of Nimshi. In the biblical text, Jehu's hailed as the founder of a new dynasty— who supplants the evil and idolatrous Omrides and slaughters the rest of their line, which by now was pretty established Israelite tradition. But, and it's a pretty big but, Assyrian records clearly refer to Jehu as the son of Omri, i.e. part of the same dynasty. And again, the Assyrians were pretty meticulous with that stuff. Historian Philip Chapek proposes an interesting theory that Jehu was textually severed from the Omrides to better contrast his piety to their blasphemy, but that he was actually, as the Assyrians recorded, a member of King Omri's family. Chapek proposes that Nimshi was literally Omri's son, likely a stepbrother of the crown prince Ahab. But that doesn't really line up well with the Tel Rahav archaeology. If Jehu's Nimshi was Tel Rahav's Nimshi, it's more likely that Nimshi was Omri's brother, uncle, or comparably aged male relative. Though son is a remote possibility. It depends on how old Omri was when he came to power and how many wives and children he had. 
Chapek highlights their similar names, as well as the prominent position of Jehu in the later royal court of Omri's grandson, King Jehoram, in arguing for a close family connection. We'll touch on this more when we get to King Jehu. For now, just consider that the wax and honey nimshis of Tel Rahav may have been related to King Omri. It was during the parallel reigns of Omri in Israel and Asa in Judah that word arrived of Asher Nasser Paul II's invasions of northern Syria. Though, honestly, since Assyria had never come that far south, the kings of Canaan were probably more wary of the Libyan pharaohs of Egypt. When Omri died around 872 BC, he was succeeded by his son, King Ahab. According to the Mesha stele, Ahab continued the oppression of Moab for most of his fairly long reign. Much more famous or infamous if you'd like, was Ahab's marriage to a Tyrian princess named Jezebel. If you want to catch up on developments in Tyre between Hiram's reign and the time of our story, you can go to the Patreon page, where I recently dropped a related mini-episode. The current king was Ithobaal I, who'd begun his career as a priest of Astarte before killing his predecessor Phales and usurping the Tyrian throne. During his reign, Tyre expanded its influence across the length and breadth of Phoenicia, and even beyond, into coastal Syria, the Akko Plain, and the nearby island of Cyprus. Tyre and Sidon apparently functioned as a joint polity, and there may have been no separate Sidonian king. Economically, cedarwood, prestige crafts, and purple dye all played significant roles. But the most noteworthy aspect of Ithobaal's Tyre was expanding Mediterranean trade. According to historian Carolina Lopez Ruiz, contemporary Tyrian materials have been found as far afield as Crete, Eubea, and even southern Spain. The kingdom also tapped into entirely new gold and silver sources flowing from Sardinia and Cilicia. Lopez Ruiz also notes that Assyrian texts from the reigns of both Asher Nasser Paul II and Shalmaneser III suggest that Tyrian agents were also active on the Euphrates as mediators in the trade between the Mediterranean coast and Assyria. Based on all the above, it's reasonable to assume that a Tyrian princess was a pretty desirable catch. Unless you hailed from a kingdom blessed with the surplus of buzzkill prophets. Full disclosure, Jezebel wasn't exactly one to hide her light under a bushel, and she rolled into Samaria with a large entourage of priests and prophets of Canaanite Baal and Asherah. Her new husband, Ahab, added fuel to the fire by raising a new altar to Baal. The couple's PR didn't really improve when Jezebel ejected Yahweh's prophets from court then started having them killed. The trend culminated in an epic god-off held at Mount Carmel, where the prophet Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal and Asherah to invoke their gods with a sacrifice. While the Canaanite gods were apparently a no-show, Yahweh actually appeared. The impromptu visit really spun up the Israelites who took Elijah's lead and killed all the prophets of Baal and Asherah down by the Kishon River. On hearing the news, Queen Jezebel fired off a note to Elijah, hinting that the river still had plenty of room for one particularly troublesome prophet. At which Elijah did what prophets do and headed off into the wilderness. In 865 B.C., King Bar-Hadad of Aram Damascus died and was succeeded by his son, hadad Azer. In the biblical account, the king soon mustered a substantial army and besieged the capital of Samaria. The resulting conflict is described in detail in 1 Kings 20, 
But the upshot is that after winning a victory with Yahweh's help, Ahab made peace with the Aramean king, reclaimed the northern towns that Bosch had lost to his father, and established reciprocal trade. A few years later, in 858, the kings of southern Syria and Canaan started hearing disturbing reports of Assyrian invasions of northern Syria under their new king, Shalmaneser III. They also learned of ad hoc coalitions who'd fought to resist the invader, with less than sanguinary results. A big unknown in this whole affair is what kind of diplomatic relations, if any, existed between kingdoms of north and south. To the extent they did, they were likely either conducted through word of mouth or written on perishable materials. Over the next few years, word came south of northern Syria's effective conquest, and the annexation of Til Barsip slash Kar Shalmaneser as an Assyrian FOB, none of which sounded particularly reassuring. And, though we don't know which party made the first move, diplomatic ties were established, or strengthened, between southern Syria's most powerful rulers, the Aramean king Hadad Azer of Aram Damascus and the Neo-Hittite king Ura Helena of Hamath. And, since we've already touched on Aram Damascus, let's talk a bit about Hamath. Hamath was a Bronze Age city along the Orontes that had been thoroughly ravaged by the Sea Peoples. As Bryce notes, it almost certainly began the Iron Age phase of its history as a kingdom ruled by a succession of Neo-Hittite kings. Ura Helena's father, King Paritas, may have paid tribute to Asher Nasser Paul II to preempt an Assyrian invasion. Bryce also notes that it's entirely possible that Hamath was intentionally avoided, being recognized even at the time as a formidable military power. It's certainly true that when Asher Nasserpal had devastated neighboring Luash, King Paritas of Hamath had taken no action. But it's also true that sometime after the Assyrians had left, Peritas invaded a weakened Luash and annexed the territory to Hamath. In inscriptions written in Luwian hieroglyphs, King Ura Helena records his construction of buildings dedicated to the goddess Balat, including a temple and granary. Another inscription refers to an entire city that Ura Helena built in her honor. Archaeology confirms Hamas Balat Temple as well as a complex of large buildings surrounding a courtyard and accessed via a fortified monumental gateway. Lion sculptures of the Hittite type flank various entrances and staircases. Long story short, since Hamath had annexed the territory of Luash, it now shared a border with Patton, the same Patton that was now an Assyrian vassal. So the big flashing warning sign saying you're next was pretty darn hard to ignore. Hence Ura Helena's intensified engagement with Hadad Azer of Aram Damascus. Like with Ahuni in northern Syria, the talks were focused on forming some kind of defensive coalition, though hopefully with better results. With that in mind, both kings leveraged their military strength and diplomatic contacts to increase their chance of success. The strongest polity between Hamath and Damascus was probably Ithobal's Tyre. While the king apparently had no interest in contributing Tyrian troops to the effort, the initiative got a more sympathetic hearing in other Phoenician territories. Another target for diplomatic outreach was one of the few northern kingdoms who'd fought Shalmaneser and managed to remain unbowed, the Cilician kingdom of Quay. Last, but certainly not least, Hadad Azer approached his newfound ally and trading partner, King Ahab of Israel. The Aramean king was likely aware that Ahab was key to the south, 
First off, the Israelite king had surprisingly good relations with the latest Judean king, Asa's son, Jehoshaphat. As evidenced by Ahab's daughter, Athaliah, marrying Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram. So one Jewish ally might easily become two. Second, Ahab's Israel still dominated Moab and may have been able to conscript Moabite soldiers to fight in Israelite campaigns. Third, both Israel and Aram Damascus bordered on the kingdom of Ammon, whose current king, Basha, no relation, might also be persuaded to join the alliance, or at least fear the outcome of trying to keep his neutrality. Again, we're envisioning months, even years, of communications, some bilateral, some more broad, to lay the groundwork to prepare for what might be coming. And in 853 BC, the time for waiting was over. Word came south that, after a few quick stopovers for pillage and plunder, the Assyrian king had recrossed the Euphrates to launch yet another campaign. As night follows day, word soon arrived of Shalmaneser accepting the tribute of his northern Syrian vassals, Sangara of Carchemish, Kundashpu of Kuma, Lali of Malachia, Halparuntaya II of Gurgum, Hayanu of Samal, Hadram of Bit Agusi, and Hal Paruntaya II, no relation, of Patton. Shalmaneser records that he next approached Aleppo. They were afraid to fight with me, so they prostrated themselves at my feet. I accepted silver and gold as their tribute. I offered sacrifices before the god Adad of Aleppo. He then left Aleppo, moving on to the cities of Urahalina, the Hamathite. Descending along the Orontes River, Shalmaneser burned Urahalina's royal cities one by one, Adenu, Barga, Argana, and, about sixty miles to the north of Hamath, a fortified city of little previous note named Karkar. Ancient World Podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network, along with My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, The Explorers Podcast, and other great shows.